this is Elisa Elwine. Welcome back to our next lesson in the Creation Gospel. I know you've probably been taking some good notes and we're going to add a whole lot more to it today as we move through the fifth day of creation and hopefully the sixth day of creation and we might even make it all the way to the Shabbat. We'll see how it goes. If you're keeping notes though, we just completed the fourth day of creation and, and we looked at those main symbols there of the sun, the moon, and the stars and the principles of separation and the principle of authority. And then we move on to day five now and we've talked about the currents, about how the movement of the wind and the movement of the sea currents is what was necessary to be put into place before the birds and the fish could actually follow those currents. And, and we call those migrations. And what is happening is those currents move those particular animals, those birds and those fish, in such a manner that it maximizes their potential to reproduce with like kind and like mind. So the living creatures are now appearing in the earth on day five. So let's review what it says in Genesis 1.20. And I'm going to point out some key words as we go this time. Then God said, let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures. Okay, right there, it, ideally we would be using a, a Hebrew Bible that would help us see something very significant in just that short phrase. Waters teem with swarms. The, the teeming and the swarming are actually coming from the same Hebrew root word, which is rots. And rots has to do with your feet and running. In fact, it's an expression of the will. I mean, when we hear the, the Kohen pronouncing the Aaronic benediction, then the proper response at the end of each blessing is, Can you hear Ratzon? We're affirming it. May it be so. And what this fifth day is doing is affirming everything that has gone on before. And that affirmation is occurring with figuratively feet because that's what the Hebrew root goes back to, running with your feet. And so when we say, swarms and teeming. In Hebrew, the idea is we're supposed to picture in our minds all kinds of numbers. It just, you know, literally swarms. When you think of a swarm of something, huge numbers of living creatures and those creatures reproducing so that the rapid movement is actually what is adding to the reproductive process. Because what they will have to do on these migrations, as they follow these currents, what they're going to find is favorable feeding grounds at favorable seasons. There's feeding grounds that are favorable at one season, but not at the other. So they would have to have that instinct built into them, the voice of Elohim built into them, in, in a way that is unique to the living creatures, to the beasts, so that that voice would tell them when to move, which, you know, th there might be abundant food right now, and he may actually move those birds or move those fish before the food actually runs out. But nevertheless, that internal clock, that instinct, that understanding of their Moedim will move them before sometimes it would appear like they should so that they can be moved to a protective place during, say, an unfavorable season. And recently, over the last year or so, we've seen a lot of articles on bird kills and fish kills, where for no apparent reason there are swarms of fish and birds that just wash up or fall down dead. And some of the articles that I've read said that in, in many of these cases, not just in North America, but in South America and uh, even as far as Europe, one of the concerns that they have is that some of these fish and birds are actually out of place in the season. 
In other words, the fish hung around in certain waters that would have been favorable in the summer, but they weren't really designed to overwinter in that area, and therefore the environment was simply too cold for them to survive, and it killed them. And the same thing with the birds. They seem to be out of their season and out of their place. And it's as though their internal clock has suffered some sort of compromise. Of course, they're trying to conjecture all the, the different things that it could possibly be that, of course, man has caused them all. I don't know that their explanation of how man has caused it is as good as what the scripture teaches us about what causes internal clocks to be off. And that's when we do not move with the spirit. Because if those birds moved with the ruach, if they move with the wind, and they hear that, that internal voice of Elohim that's telling them their appointed times to move or to be still, to feed, to reproduce, then everything should go well. There should be abundance and there should be reproduction and it's really effortless because remember, they're moving with the wind, with the ruach. And in Hebrew, ruach is wind and it's spirit. So if they're moving with the spirit, it's no big deal. We're all safe. We're all reproducing. We're all feeding. We're all working according to our appointed times. But if we start failing to move according to those appointed times or to rest at the appointed time, then we would be subject to an issue like we're seeing with these bird and fish kills because we would be at the wrong place at the wrong time. And that's what actually one of the prophets says about Israel. It says, you know, what's wrong with my people? Even the stork knows her appointed times. She even knows her Moedim, but my people don't know. And we have entered a generation where most people don't know the appointed times. They don't know the Moedim. They don't know anything about Passover. Maybe all they know about is Easter. And it's slightly off. Well, you only have to be slightly off to be out of the flow of the Spirit, to actually miss your ride, so to speak, in, in case of the birds. Because that wind, that ruach, is what is going to carry you to the next phase of your life. And... If we're not moving with the Spirit, a lot of times we will encounter static. We will encounter resistance that we really didn't have to encounter. Now, are there tests and trials? You bet. But that's different from moving apart from the appointed times. Most people don't know what the days of unleavened bread are about. When they start, when they end, what you're supposed to do in between. They don't know when first fruits of the barley is. They don't even know that Pentecost or the Feast of Weeks is so important, again, so that it's dividing the two seasons so that we could discern the times between tribulation and great tribulation. They know something about Christmas, but if you say Sukkot, they don't know what that is. They might get a, a slight clue if you say tabernacles, but see... There's a problem. They don't know the appointed times, and we need to be shining our lights much more brightly. There again, sometimes we're misled into thinking we're holy when all we've done is separate ourselves. But see, you don't put a light under a basket. You have to shine the light. You cannot be ashamed if you keep Passover. You cannot be ashamed if you eat your unleavened bread on the days appointed. You can't be ashamed for counting the weeks to Shavuot. You can't be ashamed for fasting on Yom Kippur. I know they'll say, are you Muslim? They don't know what, what to do with you because they don't know the appointed times. But it's not for you to get upset about or defensive about or make fun of them about. It's not for you to have the bad attitude. Instead, it's for you to be the light. Because remember, on the fourth day, you were taught to be a servant. The principle of authority begins with service. And so you, as the light of Messiah, knowing those appointed times that were set into place on the fourth day, you have to let them shine. And when you let light shine, it means you're a giver, not a taker. 
You see, it, it says they gave light to the earth. The sun, the moon, and the stars don't take light from the earth. If we want other human beings to know their appointed times and to begin to move with those appointed times because the bird and the fish kills, it's like a prophecy saying my people don't know their appointed times. The ones that should know don't know. How are we going to be that sun, moon, and stars for them to show them the light? We have to become givers, not takers. Light always gives. And so you have to figure out how to shine that light with a lot of mercy so that it actually is light. So they don't perceive it as some sort of darkness. And, and much of it has to do with our attitude. You know, you're never going to get past a bad attitude. And if people really aren't beginning to turn and ask about the Moedim, I don't think we can blame the black helicopters. I don't think we can blame all of the things and all of the people and governments and politics. And, uh, you know, we can't blame the Pope. All these people who get blamed, what is the point in that? If people don't see the light of the Moedim, the blame is right here because I'm not shining my light because Israel is not being the light she was called to be. There's something even about her observance of the Moedim that's not giving light. So we, we have to commit to that so we can help the birds and the fish correct their course. Remember when Yeshua called his disciples, the, the first ones he called were fishermen. He says, I will make you fishers of men. So in terms of the symbolism of the fifth day, what do the fish represent? People. And we want people, fish, to swim according to their times appointed. And that's what it says. He says, let birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarmed, same root word there, rots, after their kind, and every winged bird after its kind. And God saw that it was good. So when we move, when we learn to move with the Ruach, move with the Spirit, and move in those currents, and know the appointed times, then we are going to be fruitful. When it's just the feet that move rapidly. That's the picture you're to have of the birds and the fish. And in terms of carrying the gospel, the birds are going to be much more effective at moving the gospel and transmitting the gospel over great distances than we could have accomplished merely with the plant life of the third day. Remember the chiastic structure? that we looked at last time? If this is the third day of creation when the fruit trees were created, but this is the fifth day of creation when the birds were created, remember Yeshua is the promised seed. Well, a seed falls from a tree right underneath. It won't travel very far on its own. It may wash a certain uh, ways away, but it's not going to go very far. So until the birds appear in the earth on the fifth day, the potential is not really there to move great distances and in great numbers. But once the bird picks up that seed, if that bird moves according to the appointed times of Scripture, he is eventually going to drop that seed much farther away, maybe many miles away. And then a fruit tree can spring up there if the conditions are favorable. And then over time, another fruit will drop and another bird will come by and it'll move it miles and miles more. So eventually you can cover the entire earth if you look at the birds and the fish as vehicles of carrying the seed of the word. They're going to multiply its effect. And you can see this in Yeshua's ministry. He spent his ministry dealing with basically right there within the boundaries of Israel. He didn't go far. But he tells his disciples, not just, I'm going to make you fishers of men, which would 
imply that they're going to begin to move great distances in order to, to bring in that catch because that's what the fish do. They move on these migrations. But he's telling them that you're going to do even greater things than I did. What does he mean by that? Well, in the multiplication of disciples, as they reproduce, those who have been reproduced will in turn reproduce. And all of a sudden you have these swarms of birds and fish, symbolically men, who can carry the seed of the gospel. And that's what it says. Behold, how lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, announcing peace. Well, the feet, remember, is the root of the verbs and the nouns in the fifth day of creation. So rapidly moving feet. Now this is going to be the process by which the gospel is carried farther and multiplied until the earth is swarming with people who understand the gospel message. Now eventually we're going to have to look at what the gospel message actually is because typically it's not defined with all the understanding of what the gospel is and the prophets. So we'll have to look at that and say, is there part of the gospel message we're really not teaching as we go and we teach? So he says there's going to be winged birds that carry and reproduce after their kind. They're going to carry this seed. Jonah was a prophecy even of that because Jonah means a dove. And he was sent to Nineveh. The root of Nineveh is noon, which is a fish. So the bird was sent to the fish. The bird didn't want to go talk to the fish. He didn't want to preach the gospel to the fish. So he really kind of does a really dumb thing. He gets in a boat. If you're trying to avoid the fish, maybe getting on a boat in the sea is not the best choice because what happens is he's thrown overboard and he's swallowed by a fish. You can't avoid it. If the Spirit is sending you according to an appointed time and an appointed season to speak to the fish, then you will speak to the fish one way or the other. I would choose the first way probably over the second way because three days and three nights in the belly of a fish doesn't sound real attractive because I'm not really big on fish to begin with. So you can either go fish for the fish in Nineveh, Jonah, or I will make the fish fish you just to show you what I'm capable of. So when we receive that message and we become fishers of men, we are going to move according to the appointed times and seasons. And you can find in the book of Jonah, once you learn these, these pictures of the creation gospel, you're going to be able to isolate hints and pictures of Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot. A little bitty small book, but it's packed. There's a layer under the layer under the layer in the book of Jonah. And once you understand the fifth day of creation and, and this process of moving with these Moedim that have been set in place on the fourth day for the sake of reproduction in the kingdom, then you get why Yeshua would say, I'll make you fishers of men. And see, after he's resurrected, he keeps hinting to the disciples. They're just not really picking up on it. Because when he appears to them, of course, they think he's a ghost. They don't know that he's real. And, and he says, come on, you know, you can touch me. I am real. I mean, I, I do have a resurrected body, but I'm, I'm still flesh. That's part of what the gospel is all about. Gospel is basar. In Hebrew, it means flesh. And we have to agree that Yeshua came in the flesh as a representative because he could actually be the Son of God and the Son of Man. That's part of what the gospel is all about, is recognizing he did what he did as a human being full of the Holy Spirit, those seven spirits of Adonai absolutely resting on him. However, the gospel, the, the component of it, we cannot deny. In fact, it says to deny it is the spirit of Antichrist, is that he came in the flesh. So he says, touch me, I, I'm flesh, I'm like you. Not exactly like you, but I'm like you. He says, I'll prove it to you. Let's have something to eat. What does he ask them for? fish. And later he says, you know what? Meet me up in the Galilee. Go up there. 
Well, what do they do when they get to the Galilee? They go fishing. And they look over on the beach, and there's Yeshua on the beach cooking breakfast, and guess what he's cooking? Fish. So the fish here are going to continue to remind the disciples of their destiny of their appointed times and what they must do next. If they're going to do greater things, if they're going to carry the good news into all the world and they're going to testify and they're going to teach people how to obey the gospel, then they have to understand this principle of the fifth day, knowing the appointed times and the seasons so that we're moving in a favorable time so that the gospel can increase and that those who carry the gospel can increase knowing the appointed time you know it says in scripture may our prayers to you be at the right time and you think well is there a bad time to pray no not really i mean he's as close as the prayer however there are favorable times for favorable things to happen within that appointed time and if you discern these moedim then you will understand pretty much what type of prayer is going to be the most efficacious during that appointed time and when it may not be. But we can always cry out for mercy. If we get into trouble, if we get blown off course, if some poor little seagull gets blown off course into Kentucky somewhere, let's hope that he would cry out for mercy and repent and the Spirit would lead him right back to the beach so that he could join with like kind and like mind. Now your key words from day five are going to be teeming and swarms. Teeming and swarms. And remember that, that shirats comes from roots, roots or rats, which means rapidly moving feet, great numbers. Birds and fish, those are the two most important pictures on day five. And the fact that not only are they fruitful and multiply, remember chiastic structure? The trees were described, you know, as fruit and reproducing after like kind. Same thing's going to happen with the fifth day of creation because they spring from the same source. It says they're going to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the waters in the seas. And the seas, actually, in Scripture, represents the nations. So these fish, these men, are going to fill the waters in the nations. They're going to fill the nations. And the gospel message is going to reach the four corners of the earth because of that, that fruitfulness that begins occurring on the fifth day to carry the seed of the gospel. Now, let's go on. Let's press into the sixth day of creation. It's a very significant day because up to this point, we have a lot of preparation going on, but now it's time for the man. But the man is not created first on the sixth day. He's created last. In other words, he is this uh, final creation. And so we understand then that pretty much everything is completed on the sixth day except for the man, and he is going to be that final act of creation other than you actually, he had to create the Shabbat. And you do have to be pretty creative when it comes to Shabbat sometimes. That, that can be a bigger challenge than the other six days of the week. But rest had to be created. But in, in terms of what is being seen in the visible realms, the sixth day is going to complete the, the process of creation as far as the, the living creatures. So let's read Genesis 1.26. Then God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle and creeping things, and beasts of the earth after their kind, and it was so. God made the beasts of the earth after their kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind. And God saw that it was good. Now let me pause right here. 
Did you hear how many times the beasts of the earth were described as after their kind? After their kind, after their kind, after its kind. That's not accidental. There are a variety of beasts that are created on the sixth day, and it describes the different types of beasts that are created aside from the fish and the, the water beasts. And as long as it reproduced after its kind, it says God saw that it was good. But let's just do a thought question before we persist on and, and look at the creation of man. What if the beasts did not reproduce after their kind? What if they reproduced after a different kind? Would there be a problem? Okay, let's go on. We've got the creation of the beasts, and they are going to reproduce after their kind. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Hmm. Well, we can see the point of creating the man last because he really is after a different kind than what has come before. He's after a different kind over the cattle. He's after a different kind over the creepy things. He's after a different kind, but he's over the birds of the sky. He's a different kind than the fish of the sea. Man has something unique about him. He is actually made in the image of Elohim. He is not Elohim, but he is made in the image of Elohim. He is going to be given a, a unique gift because he is made according to the image of Elohim, he is going to have the ability to speak the words of Elohim after him in a unique way. Because remember, a beast, whether we're talking about a bird or a fish, or whether we're talking about a cow or a lizard, they work or they move according to instinct. It's the voice of Elohim that, that comes from an inner place so that they can discern their times and their seasons. But if they speak, it is not exactly the way that the man speaks. Now, it does say, and, and we don't know if it's referring to everything or not, but it, it says basically before the, the judgment on the Tower of Babel that all the earth was of one accord. They were all of one speech. So it's not clear, is it talking about just the men were of one speech? Or did we actually have the ability to have a dialogue with the creatures? Well, you could probably support a case yes or no. Obviously, the serpent has the ability to communicate with Eve. Was this serpent carrying on, which we know he probably wasn't speaking English, but were they using the same language exactly, or was it simply a mode of communication? Is it possible that part of the curse on the beast was that he could no longer communicate with mankind? There's a lot of what-ifs that we could pack in there, but one thing is for sure. Elohim breathes into Adam. And in terms of the Ruach, remember the, the breath is the Ruach. It's the movement of the spirit. So he is breathing his spirit into the man. And as the man inhales the spirit, 
What is the only thing he could possibly exhale? The spirit of Elohim. The only thing that has gone in is uncorrupted because it's the spirit of Elohim being breathed into him. And so at this moment, he is completely pure. He is completely holy. He is reflecting the image of Elohim. He has to make a conscious choice to put something else in his body to partake of another spirit so that the speech will no longer be pure. But he has the ability to speak the words of Elohim after him in his image, in his likeness. And through that word, because the speech is actually part of what Adam's doing in the earth, we have to read for it. It seems like there's two creation accounts. Not really. It's the same thing. But if you think about it, in the first account in Genesis 1, we only have one-seventh of a day's explanation. And actually, technically, we only have one-half of one-seventh that is explaining to us about the creation of man. So as we progress on, we get more information about it. So it's, it's not as though they are antithetical to one another. One will explain the other, the circumstances and so forth. And so we know for Adam to act in the image of Elohim, what he is expected to do is to use his power of speech to name the animals. And so it says that Elohim would bring the animal to Adam. And it says that Adam would look at this animal. He would have to put eyeballs on it. He, he would look at this animal and perceive the essence of what that creature was. And in perceiving the essence of the creature, he could very accurately put a name. With the power of speech, he could put a name on that creature that would reflect what that creature was. And this was probably, I'm sure, a very long process. But we see there one of the unique abilities that the human has over the, the realm of the animals, over the realm of the creatures. And I'm not really sure how he did all that with the fish. That might have been a real feat. Um, but let me say, if he's made in the image of Elohim, probably not a problem. The logistics to us in hindsight are a little puzzling. Nevertheless, being able to speak the words of Elohim after him is part of uniquely being human. Because if you think about the way a beast would speak, even if it could speak, let's say, let's just roll it back and say, well, the serpent was speaking, let's just say a beast can speak. Although there's really only one other example, and that would be uh, Balaam's donkey. And that would appear to be a, a surprise. And because Peter calls the donkey mute, he says they can't speak. And that was what the miracle was, that he allowed the donkey to speak. But at some point, we know that the serpent could speak. How he did that, we're not sure. But how would you expect a beast to express himself? Would you expect the beast to necessarily quote the Torah accurately? Or would you more expect the beast to express himself according to the inner instinct that Elohim put into him? Because he was after a different kind. And it specifically says that as Adam names all these creatures and he sees all these living creatures, that he could not find one that corresponded to him. There was no mate for him. There was nothing. I mean, he might have looked at monkeys and thought, mm, close, but no cigar. That's not who I am. That's a different kind. People today aren't that intelligent. However, you can look in the animal, animal kingdom and see similarities, but you have to recognize there is nothing out there corresponding to me. You have to come to the same conclusion that Adam did. And, of course, Elohim's got to be thinking, well, you're right, because the thing that is corresponding to you is still within you. 
I want you to see every one of these beasts. I want you to consider every one of them and you'll have to consider their essence as you name them because you have to discern them to name them. You are going to meet every beast of the field and in that process I'm going to demonstrate to you that there is nothing out there after your kind because you're made in my image. You are after my kind. This is different. The instinct that I've put in a beast, you actually share that part, Adam. You have the lowest part of your soul, which is called a nephesh, and that's something you have in common with an animal because a nephesh is described as a bundle of appetites. The nephesh is the things we desire. It's those very... Uh, primal needs. We get hungry. That's because we have a nephesh. We get thirsty because we have a nephesh. We want to reproduce because we have a nephesh. We have that in common with the animals. We want to secure our territory so that we can do those things in safety. We have that in common with an animal. In fact, we want to enlarge that territory so that we can control others so that we can do more of the eating, sleeping, drinking, reproducing, taking care of those primal needs. And a lot of times you will see human beings who really focus only on the desires of the nephesh. That's one of the things that's addressed as far as Babylon in the book of Revelation. It calls Babylon basically one who has lived sensuously. Sensuously. In other words, according to the senses, the thing you have in co common with an animal. An animal gets hungry. An animal gets sleepy. It gets thirsty. It wants to reproduce. It wants to hold territory to do more of those things. An animal can get its feelings hurt. You can absolutely hurt your dog's feelings. It has feelings. And none of those things is bad. The nephesh is a necessary part of who you are as a human being. Without it, you trust me, you'd be dead. Because if you didn't respond to those senses that tell you you're hungry, you would starve to death. If you didn't respond to the sense that tells you you're thirsty, you would dehydrate and you would die. If we didn't respond to the part of us that tells us we need to reproduce, Eventually, there'd be no more people. There'd be no more reproduction. If we didn't understand feelings and the way that they work and that they could actually protect us and save our lives so that we can perceive danger, time to run, we would be dead because we wouldn't run when the lion was chasing us. Those are the sorts of things that are at the lowest level of the soul. And in Judaism, it's understood that the nephesh is identified with the human heel. Number one, because the heel is the part of the body that comes into contact with the earth. That's the part of who you are. It actually kind of has something there in common with the fifth day of creation, with the rapidly moving feet. But it's the lowest part of you. It's the lowest part of your body. And your body is actually just a parable of Elohim. It's not the real thing, but the elements are there to teach us. See, we don't have a heart. Elohim has a heart. We usually flip it and we say, well, we just can't understand what God is like. So we're, we're using, you know, um, the human descriptors because God really doesn't have a heart like we have a heart. Well, he doesn't have a heart like we have a heart. We're actually living the parable. What he has is the reality. What he does is he uses physical objects to direct our thinking. When he wants us to understand his heart, he gives us a human heart to help us learn about him. But his is the reality. This is not the reality. This is the proverb. This is the parable to help direct our thinking. So Adam's looking at these beasts and he understands they're working on a little bit different principle. They're working basically at the lowest part of who he is. Yes, I have this in common with them, but I have something extra. 
And we could talk about the different levels of the soul, but what's most important is the spirit for the, the purpose of this study because we're going to tie it in to the seven spirits of Adonai. And the head in Judaism represents the spirit. The Rosh represents the spirit because it's this part that is connecting to the will of the Father in heaven. This part down here that seems to be subject to whims of our desires, our senses. But because we've got this part of our head, which represents the spirit, the head remains over the heels. When the head is over the heels, that tells you that the spirit is mastering the nephesh, the animalistic part of us. Which remember, in and of itself, it is not a bad thing. The only improper thing about our nephesh is that too many times we allow our heel to get over our head, which is a rather awkward position for a human being, you have to admit. So we allow our senses and our desires and our instincts, the things that we have in common with a beast, and we actually try to reproduce after that kind because that's the fruit that's coming out of us is because we are imitating their behavior. That's all they have to go on. They don't have this same connection where we are made in the image of Elohim. And so we allow the nephesh, the desire to get over the head, which means that the lowest part of us is basically driving the car, and that's dangerous. We were created in order for his spirit, the spirit that he breathes into us, the Holy Spirit to master, to rule over, did you catch that out of the text? To rule over the animal part of us. You're eating, you're drinking, you're sleeping, you're reproducing, you're enlarging your territory. Those sorts of things are to be mastered by the Holy Spirit in order for them to be good. In order for him to see it as good, the head has to stay over the heel. But when we act according to desire, we have put the heel over the head and we've actually listened to the serpent because we have identified after that kind. And there is nothing out there in the animal kingdom that we resemble that's after our kind. All we are sharing is that part of the nephesh. But there is so much more of us in the image of Elohim. And what we've allowed to happen is, is the lowest part of our nature to master what should be the highest part. And that's why you see with this information given to Adam and Eve about the curse that is going to set in because of their behavior, because they've allowed their heels to get over their head. He said, here's what's going to happen. And he's speaking to the serpent as well. He says, your seed, referring to the serpent's seed. You know the serpent has seed. If you don't know the serpent has seed and he's reproducing, check how many times John the Baptist and Yeshua call people vipers and the sons of vipers. A brood of vipers. The serpent is reproducing. All right. He says, your seed is going to be able to bruise the woman's seed's heel. The woman also has seed. And sometimes we get really involved in talking about the seed of Abraham and the seed of Messiah and so forth. Then we kind of overlook something given back here in Genesis is that the woman has seed. And he says the serpent's seed is going to be able to bruise the heel of her offspring. But Actually, there's some great secrets embedded in a Torah portion called Tazria. Tazria. Because when we read it literally, it says when the woman sows seed. And then it describes when she sows a female seed, when she sows a male seed. So the seed of the woman all through history is going to be a question mark. And, and you're going to see it in the lives of the matriarchs. Sarah was put in a position where she could have committed adultery. 
Rebecca was put in a position where she could have committed adultery. Both of those women were actually put in that position by their husbands. As you go through there, Tamar is suspected of adultery. Rahab is seen as a prostitute. But as we work through these women, like Mary Magdalene, everybody assumes she was a prostitute. But what is the first word out of Yeshua's mouth when he resurrects and sees a human being? He says, woman. He's addressing Mary Magdalene. It's as if he's clearing up any questions as to her character and her fitness to witness. Because he says, go tell my disciples and Peter. So, the seed of the woman through history is in jeopardy because the woman's seed, the Messiah, has to be incorruptible. And the woman's seed will continue to be tested throughout history because in the long run, if you compare Proverbs 31, the virtuous woman or the heroic woman, with the description of the harlot also in Proverbs and also in the book of Revelation. And you look at the other descriptions of the spirit of wisdom and understanding in the book of Proverbs, and you you make a comparison chart, you're going to realize that both the virtuous woman and the harlot or the adulteress, they're doing the same things, they're calling out to the same people, they're sitting in the same places. They're very much doing and and looking the same. So how are we going to tell the difference? Well, one way we tell the difference is that those women who their reputation and their character was under a cloud of suspicion, they proved to be virtuous because number one, they kept the commandments, and number two, they always pointed their husbands or their significant male influence. It might have been Miriam with Moses who was her brother, they're always in the act of preservation so that the seed can continue and be returned to the land, the covenant, and the people. Those three things. And that's how you're going to be able to tell the virtuous woman from the harlot. So the seed of the woman is the one who will return mankind to the land, the covenant, and the people. And the covenant is the Torah. But we see the beginnings of this conflict right here in Genesis on the sixth day of creation because the deal with the serpent is he's, it says, more cunning than all the beasts of the field. Well, if you look at the context of the beasts of the field, you realize that this is a historical battle that goes on. Where did Cain and Abel quarrel? They quarreled in a field. Esau was a man of the field. But it says Jacob was a man of the tents. Read the description of Esau when he's born. This man of the field, it says he's red and hairy all over. He's like an animal. And when Jacob wants to dress up like Esau, he puts animal skins on him so that you can't tell him apart. Because Esau is like a beast. That's going to be the difference. Are you a man or are you a beast? Do you identify with the image of Elohim? Do you want to reproduce after that kind? Or do you want to reproduce after the image of the beast? Do you want to reason and think like a serpent? Who it says is more cunning than all the beasts of the field. In other words, he is the spokesperson spoke serpent for the beasts of the field he's speaking on their behalf and you know for a beast he's really not that far off base because you would expect a beast to think the way the serpent is thinking but the man is supposed to be smart enough to know the difference between the nefesh and the ruach between the lowest part of the soul and the spirit He's supposed to know the difference between the animal part of him and the spiritual part of him. He has to know how to differentiate because he has named every animal. He knows the difference between an animal and who he is in the image of Elohim. 
and he has to know that to act according to that reasoning and that instinct that the serpent is talking about is to actually reproduce after their kind, not after the kind that I was created to be. And so here again, we're on the sixth day of creation. We're talking about the dynamics and the tension between the beasts of the field and the man. And you can see that same tension right there in Revelation. The, the question in Revelation is not the number six. The question is, on day six, which represents the man, it's the Hebrew letter Bob represents man, will you be proven to be a man made in the image of Elohim after his kind of the seed of Messiah? Or will you be proven to have behaved after the kind of the beast and to have spoken his words after him? Because the rationale that Adam and Eve are using is absolutely the rationale of a beast that works on instinct. And again, that part of us is not a bad thing. It's not unholy. But if it is allowed to master the man, now it's out of order. Now we're not going to get the, the results that this human being was designed to obtain in the creation. How will we rule if we have allowed the heel to rule our head? Well, you can't unless the spirit is ruling the nephesh. There is no way that we can rule on this earth reign on this earth and to maintain the earth and uphold the earth with the word of our Messiah. How could we do it? It won't work backward. We have to identify with the image of Elohim, not the image of the beast. And it will be clearly delineated in Revelation who is actually worshiping and adhering to and obeying the image of the beast. It's that simple. It's really not rocket science. We'll see you next time.